A very good evening to all our viewers in India and a good day to all our viewers who are joining us from other parts of the world. I'm Divya Bansal, currently the Dean of Alumni and International Relations and also Professor of Computer Science at PEC. On behalf of Punjab Engineering College, we'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Krishnamurti Subramanyam, India's Chief Economic Advisor, who's also the part of the core finance ministry team who has taken the most challenging role of assessing and managing the impact of COVID-19 on the Indian economy. Clearly, they are, these are very challenging times for the country and all of us, and it is quite difficult to predict as to what is going to happen in the next few months or even years in the given volatile and uncertain times. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very privileged to have Dr. Krishnamurti Subramanyam, also fondly known as Subhu, to our fourth edition of PEC Centenary Lecture Series. As we march towards completing our journey of 100 glorious years, and as a part of our celebrations, we have Centenary Lecture Series, which feature venerable and eminent global personality from all walks of life. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Dhirat Sanghi, Director Peck. Our new admits to our BTEC program have also joined the virtual floor today and are with us. Before we move on, I would also like to introduce you to our faculty, Dr. Vasundra Singh, Professor in Department of Applied Sciences at PEC, who has been teaching here and has an experience of 30 years of teaching and research and leads drug discovery and green chemistry research at PEC. Our host for the evening is our own alum, Mr. Sarafjeet Virk, who graduated from production engineering in the year 2003. He's the managing director of Finbasa, Finbasia Group, a diversified company focusing financial services, NPFC real estate, with global offices in India and overseas. He's also been the member board of governors of PEC and immediate past chairman, Confederation of Indian Industry, Chandigarh Council. Once again, we are delighted to have Dr. Subramanian with us, who will be interacting with us on post-COVID economy. I would now request Dr. Vasundra to formally welcome and introduce our distinguished speaker to all our viewers. I'm now going to hand over the proceedings to my colleague, Dr. Singh. Over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Divya. A very good evening to one and all. It is my humble privilege to introduce on behalf of the fraternity of Punjab Engineering College, the eminent speaker for today, Dr. K.V. Subramanian. Quote, if your only ambition is to become rich, it shows an extreme poverty of ambition, unquote. These are the great words and message of Dr. Subramanian, which he conveyed to the students on being conferred with the award of Corporate Control and Merger Scores by ISB. A very profound, intense, and far-reaching thought, sir, for the youth in these challenging times. Among Dr. Subramanian's many prominent personality attributes, he is a man so vigilant and yet so humble in his demeanor that we are very honored to have him with us today. He has nurtured young minds and spread the passion for education in his students and has taught them to value knowledge far beyond scoring good grades. Dr. Krishnamurti Subramanian, currently the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India, is a leading expert on economic policy, banking, and corporate governance. He has authored the path-breaking economic survey that commends ethical wealth creation for a prosperous India and is highly acclaimed. Budding out as a young electrical engineering student in IIT Kanpur in 1994, he further proceeded to pursue MBA and back the top ranked position in IIM Calcutta in 1999. In 2005, he did his PhD, Financial Economics, at Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago under the advice of Professor Lunji Zingalis and Professor Raghuram Rachan. Dr. Subramanian's PhD dissertation earned him the prestigious Ewing Marion Hoffman, Kaufman Foundation Dissertation Fellowship, which recognizes the top 15 PhD dissertations across all disciplines every year. Sir, your academic achievements are indeed inspirational. To address the current situation due to the pandemic, do tune in to, to our session live where Dr. Krishnamurti Subramanian today will be sharing his insights on what the economic impact in India will be like post-COVID-19 and how the Indian economy has dealt with it so far. 
So it is my great pleasure to invite you to share your thoughts with the August gathering on the most awaited topic, post-COVID economy. Over to you, sir, Dr. Subramanian. Very good evening uh, to one and all. Professor Dheeraj Sanghi, the director of Punjab Engineering College, um, Dean Divya, faculty um, and alumni and students of the um, esteemed Punjab Engineering College. Let me first start out by congratulating all the stakeholders of Punjab Engineering College for um, hitting a century. Um, I, I think that's quite creditable. Um, even in cricket, a century is valued. And so I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, Peck would, uh, would really value it. Incidentally, uh, talking on a day when India won the, the one day cricket match against Australia, I think, you know, makes the century possibly even sweeter. So uh, once again, heartiest congratulations to everyone that is involved uh, with, with Peck. Um, I, when I got the invite from Professor Sanghi, he also sent me a very nice uh, set of inputs on the very, very rich history of, of a Punjab Engineering College. And uh, I think um, uh, it, it's, it's something to be really proud of. And so I, my, my double congratulations to all those who are involved in building, building this history. Uh, and I think among them, students, alumni and faculty are by far the most important because today's students become tomorrow's alumni. And um, one of the things that I've always believed is that in any educational institution, the alumni and the faculty are the most um, interested stakeholders because they are the ones that really uh, benefit from the brand of the institution itself. And they, therefore, their incentives are perfectly aligned with that of the institution. So um, I'm very glad to see uh, a very, very illustrious alumni actually part of the session as well. Um, so let me start out by first um, saying um, that I, I would like to, to, to be more optimistic than the uh, introduction that Professor Divya Bansal gave about the, about the economy. Uh, and this is not just because I am an incorrigible optimist. Um, I am indeed a, a, an incorrigible optimist, but when I share my optimism, you know, beyond my own private thoughts, uh, those are based on, on, on credible data and empirical evidence. It's just not, um, you know, emotion. Um, I think emotion is fine for one's private thoughts, but uh, uh, my public utterances actually on this are based on data. So let me first, um, you know, set aside any, um, you know, any uh, sort of, walls crashing kind of thought that might have come uh, by hearing the introduction about the economy from Professor Bansal. Um, I, I think India, you know, uh, has indeed uh, illustrated, demonstrated the resilience that the Indian economy has with the Q2 numbers. Um, you know, after a decline of uh, almost 23.9% in Q1, uh, which indeed was because of the lockdown, and I'll actually have something to say about it, um, you know, before I, I, I uh, talk about the, uh, the, the path forward. But just the fact that from 23.9% to, you know, go to 7.5% now is testimony to the resilience that, that uh, you know, India has. Um, and I must tell you, having actually lived um, in the Western world, you know, um, in the United States for close to a decade, uh, this is one aspect that oftentimes a lot of, you know, uh, um, onlookers from the from from abroad miss about the Indian psyche and the Indian economy itself. That the resilience that that we have, uh, and I think that is demonstrated in the Q2 numbers. Um, uh, let me first uh, share a few thoughts about um, what has been our principal uh, to the, you know, uh, to the, to the, to the uh, you know, uh, principal underlying the response to the COVID crisis, um, which, <clears throat> of course, um, is a health crisis. And one of the first things that all of us must acknowledge is that 
the um, you know the the effects that we are seeing in the economy are all stemming from the pandemic um, and uh, you know i think one simple factoid that must uh, be remembered in this context is that uh if you look at the number of countries where the gdp per capita is going to shrink or the number of countries where there is going to be a recession this year uh that uh, you know that number is 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 the highest in the last 150 years and this is a statistic that was you know shared by the world economic outlook um so uh, you know i think the the economic impact has to be seen in that light when we are living through an event that is once in a one and a half centuries i think you know uh, that definitely has to uh, you know impact the, the way in which we we view this um, it is a, a pandemic um, of a magnitude that was seen uh, the last you know uh, more than 100 years back when the spanish flu pandemic uh, impacted the world around the first world war um 19 1918 and 1919 so in the last 100 years um, you know the world has not seen a pandemic like this so uh, you know possibly certainly our fathers generation and you know um, grandfathers generation you know uh, could not be part of this uh, unfortunately dubious part dubious history in some sense um, but we are we are seeing that so uh, i think that perspective is f- the first thing that all of us have to remember um, that the economic impact actually is because of the pandemic i think that is not the point point number 1 uh, the second point and actually you know you see a lot of um, uh, uh, discussion you know a lot of people saying oh the indian economy was slowing down even before the pandemic and and this is just you know continuation of that of that uh, um, you know of that slow down and uh, i don't know how many of you actually uh, follow um, some of the the events around the economic calendar but if you did um, i had uh, you know uh, i had i held a press conference after the second quarter numbers were released where i made a detailed presentation on the on the economy um, and that is available you know on the on the uh, press information bureau's website and on youtube as well i would urge you to take a look at that um, uh, you know and i showed it showed a lot of uh, data there to first make the point that the if you look at the indian economy the way it was evolving till february of this year and you know uh, i i there is a chart there where uh, the indicators from august of last year august 2019 till march is shown um, and and which clearly illustrates that the indian economy was you know gathering very good momentum till february and this is not by the way opinion this is facts um, using for instance data like the per purchasing managers index the uh, export uh, numbers the industrial production index of industrial production the core sector eight core sector output freight railway freight um, the uh, you know eway bills all these indicators each one of them had been actually trending up uh, up until february uh, but they they nose dived in the month of march because the pandemic hit india in the month of march and uh, this also you know you're all engineers so you know would be very very uh, you know comfortable with data if you go and check the google mobility data uh, google mobility data shows very clearly that uh, mobility was down in india in the month of march by about 20% compared to the january and february levels um and this is you know even before the lockdown so the lockdown of course happened in the last week of march but the mobility was down by 20% in the month of march itself and as a result the economic activity got significantly impacted in the month of march um now if you were to do a thought experiment which said if india had you know uh, started experiencing the the covid pandemic from the month of uh, of april instead of march um, you know and the economic activity would have been uh, you know would have continued that momentum 
then I can, you know, I can assure you, and this is again based on data, that the uh, last quarter growth rate would have been much higher than the third quarter growth rate for, you know, for last year. Which means that, you know, this this uh, this this narrative of a slowdown that was continuing, you know, is something that would not have happened if the uh, pandemic had not hit in the month of March. Because, you know, and, and people like uh, Sarvajit Singh would, would vouch for this, that the last month of the financial year is by far the most important because a lot of economic activity happens in the month of March. And in some sense, it was, you know, unfortunate that, um, uh, you know, that, that the uh, pandemic started impacting India in the month of March. Um, and thereby this sort of narrative has been painted by just by looking at the, the, the broad GDP number. But oftentimes, you know, the, the important uh, uh, narrative lies when you unpack and open the sort of the, the hood of the car, if you wish, and, and look at what was happening. So that's point number one that I wanted to state that this narrative that the uh, you know Indian economy was slowing down, and what you're seeing now, you know, amidst the pandemic, is basically a continuation of that slowdown is incorrect. Um, secondly, if you see the uh, the uh, Q1 decline, and this is something you know, I have written an article in the Indian Express um, after um, you know one of the uh, former former finance ministers had. Uh, I had, had basically called into question the recovery that that I had uh, talked about. You know, after the first quarter, uh, you know, uh, print I had said that there was a V-shaped recovery that was going on. Um, and in response, I actually wrote an article in the Indian Express where I showed very clearly by plotting the intensity of the lockdown as measured by Oxford University on the x-axis. And you know the GDP decline across countries on the y-axis. Um, you can go and check that out. It's there in the press conference as well. Uh, you know, if you draw a chart basically, and you know have all the countries and have a line of fit, India falls on that line of fit exactly on that on that line of fit. So um, it, you know what what that therefore suggests is that India India's GDP decline in the uh, in the in the first quarter was primarily because of the lockdown, the intensity of the lockdown. You know where a lot of economic activities were basically where where um, you know uh, where, where restricted. Now, which brings me then to the reason for the lockdown. Why is it that India required an intense lockdown? I think this is something which is very important to understand before I move on to uh, talking about you know, my, the future, the outlook for the economy. Um, back around the mid, around mid March, when evidence started coming in about increase in cases, you know, um, in, in 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 Wuhan, and how you know the lockdown had actually slowed down that pandemic, um, you know, we basically went and looked at a lot of the research that had been done on the Spanish flu pandemic, um, and one of the things that came that that you know was very informative. That is that you know, and this is epidemiological research which showed that a pandemic, uh, you know, the the pace of spread is like uh, it, like that of a network, you know. And many of you, those who are you know in electrical engineering and computer science, would be you know uh, um, do, taking classes in network theory. I certainly do remember you know uh, doing a class in network. Uh, you know, net network analysis uh, at IIT Kanpur during my electrical engineering uh, courses. Um, now, epidemiological, uh, you know, uh, phenomena also are, you know, are like our network phenomena. Um, and you know, therefore, the pace of spread of a pandemic is much higher in a larger network. Um, only because, you know, basically in a, in a larger network, you know, the likelihood of one person infecting far more, you know, uh, uh, the number of people that that is much higher and so the pace of spread is you know much higher in a larger population that's point number one the second point is that the pace of spread is especially higher when you know in densely populated areas and you know in in india and in south asia in general we live in possibly in not possibly actually the most densely populated 
uh, you know uh, areas anywhere in the world um, now this is because social distancing becomes difficult and closer you know to, to people the likelihood of them getting you know getting it you know uh, passing on the infection from one way from each to, to each other is actually much higher so the population density is the second parameter that affects the the pace of spread of the pandemic um, so when you took that into account the fact that india you know uh, uh, um, is is basically you know has a large population is densely populated and third because india actually has a lot of you know uh, um, is is globalized compared to some of the other you know economies in south asia there are a lot of people that travel to and fro from india to to, to you know to foreign countries and and thereby coming so you know while the uh, the uh, a lot of testing etc was started you know as soon as you know cases uh, started in wuhan but the fact is that india did, you know was far more uh, uh, you know has far more you know interactions with rest of the world in terms of people to people people coming in than some of the other countries uh, and and that is the other th third dimension so as a result you know given that the pace of spread would be much higher in india the uh, choice that that we had was between you know between bad and worse and that is what you know all policy makers across the world have had to choose between you know between bad and worse so if for instance we did not have a lockdown and this is something that you know a lot of epidemiological research has also demonstrated um, you know um, and and some of my my batchmates from uh, you know from from i from iit kanpur in my batch are themselves professors uh, you know at, at various uh, top universities and i have been in consultation with them as well and based on that and some other research I actually you know can can highlight that if for instance the lockdown had not been implemented we might have been easily having 50 to 60000 cases you know uh, just by the, the second half of april 50 to 60000 cases and uh, now you know i want you to track this number so keep the 50 to 60000 cases that i mentioned you know one of one statistic second uh, if you looked at the mortality rates in the month of april the mortality rates were about 4 and 1/2% now it's actually less you know about 1% you know a little uh, less than 1% now that's because of the learning that has happened you know the entire medical you know the healthcare system has learned how to deal with these cases but early in april that learning you know had not happened and that's why the mortality rates were 4 and 1/2% now if you think about this mortality rate of 4 and 1/2% was with a few hundred cases that was coming in you know because in the during that time if you had a you know a, a situation where 50 to 60000 cases that 100 times as many cases were coming in in the month of april you know with the kind of health infrastructure that we had the there is no way that we would have actually been able to keep that mortality rate at 4 and 1/2% it would have been far higher and that is one of the key things that epidemiological research you know pointed out that faced with the pandemic it was important to flatten the curve what does that mean that you know if you be, did not have a lockdown you would have a curve like this with a very sharp peak and that peak being you know being hit very quickly in contrast if you flatten the curve you know that peak becomes actually much much uh, you know sh shorter it's like you're spreading that distribution and all of you again you know engineers would understand the distribution so when you have a very you know sharp distribution the mass is basically just around the middle in contrast if you flatten the distribution then the peak is is, is much lower now this is important to remember because you know a lot of people ask the question what was the impact of the lockdown look um you know when you till you don't have a vaccine the number of you know uh, people who will get infected remains the same with or without the lockdown what you get to do is to just flatten that curve you know in other words the area under that curve you know again i'm i'm, I'm talking you know uh, math here that area under the curve actually remains the same you know between with or without the lockdown is just that with the lockdown you actually spread that curve out and so you know you actually get a much smaller much shorter peak and thereby you provide the health infrastructure the ability to ramp up 
to be able to deal with the cases that is what the lockdown does the lockdown and testing together actually testing does slow and testing and quarantining helps in you know reducing the spread but overall the cases will happen so the area under the curve remains the same with or without the lockdown and what the uh, the, the the lockdown actually did was to reduce that 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 uh, you know that peak so if you did not have the lockdown you know one can easily project that the mortality rate should have been far higher than 4.5% might have been close to 6 7% maybe even 10% you know given the kind of um, then you do the numbers 50 to 60000 cases you know just in the second half of april and you know maybe 7 8% let's say mortality we would have been looking at you know at 4 to 5000 deaths a day grieving at 4 to 5000 deaths a day you know in the month of april itself and then you know far more so the the main principle that actually drove you know the in the indian government's response to to the pandemic was a very humane one which is that while gdp you know uh, growth will recover and it is indeed recovering i think the evidence you know is is clearly demonstrative of that you know human lives once they are lost you cannot bring them back you know gdp growth you can bring that back but human lives once they are lost you cannot bring them back and that is the central humane principle that actually drove the the response um, you know in and in you know uh, uh, for instance uh, uh, the the, the It, it was mentioned that one of the principles that actually I have, I generally tell the students is that if your only ambition in life is to become rich, it shows an extreme poverty of ambition. You know, if you think about applying the same thing here, you know, if the only objective faced with the pandemic was just you know thinking about GDP, then I think that actually would have shown an a, a poverty of ambition as well. Um, so so so. Uh, it is important, therefore, to recognize that you know um, that that uh, this 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 humane principle drove the response to the pandemic. Now, from an economic perspective as well, and this is something which is important to remember. Um, un- undoubtedly, you know, a GDP decline, you know, is something that creates difficulties, especially for people people at the bottom of the pyramid. You know, I don't think anybody will deny that. I certainly will not. But I think this is the counterfactual that we have to keep in mind. If, for instance, you had you know far more deaths, five hundred, you know, uh, 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 let's say five thousand to six thousand deaths a day just in the month of April, and then you cumulate it over you know over over the, the six 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 odd months, right? Uh, then think about it. You know, people at the bottom of the pyramid typically have households of five people with one bread earner. if that one bread earner you know has to suffer the unfortunate consequence of death then four others become destitute now you know that household of five people you know in a uh, in a, in an economy where it is shrinking of course does face difficulty you know undeniably but it is it is you know it's bad uh, but you know if they actually have their bread 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 winner you know having to suffer the unfortunate consequence of death it's far far worse and and that is something that is a reality of india that also has had to be kept in mind so as i said at the outset faced with a pandemic like that policy makers have to choose between you know bad and worse and the other important point is that you know you, you policy maker knows the counterfactual which is that you know if we had not done the lockdown what would have prevailed that the common people you know because that does not manifest in reality it just remains something as a counterfactual something that could have been but never was um, and and that is what we have to keep in mind and that you know i i am actually convinced that the uh, you know that the choice that was made indeed has saved a lot of lives and that's reflected in the data you know uh, if you look at per capita deaths and that is what you have to do uh, you know again as engineers i'm sure you actually you know are are careful with data if you just care to compare the, the actual number of deaths that is affected by population the amount of population if you do it on a per capita basis then you're doing an apples to apples comparison when you do the per capita comparison india's per capita death actually is about is 110 to 112 you know of many of the other other countries 
and this is not just because of you know of of uh, uh, um, the, it, it, the 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 point point that you know if we have a young population it's not just because of that because if you do the tabulation if you take the number of elderly people you know 60 plus people who were far more vulnerable india has more 60 plus people than many countries you know despite the fact that they actually have pulled a population because our population itself is large and so we could have easily had you know uh, that, that elderly population being you know suffering the you know lots of deaths and many of our you know elders thereby possibly not being with us today if we did not have you know if we did not follow this this policy i think this is something which is very important for you know for all citizens to understand the public policy choices uh, and the trade offs that are involved especially you know when faced with a you know with 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 a, with, a, with a pandemic you know that is historic um, um, as 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 i said so uh, uh, to summarize what i've just said, so said so far um, the response has been driven by a humane principle that uh, you know lives are far far more precious than you know than the than the than the gdp um, you know and 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 that's what has has driven the response which is indeed reflected in the actual number of cases the per capita deaths and uh, you know other similar statistics on the uh, relating to the pandemic uh, last point on the pandemic before i actually start going into you know my outlook for the you know for for the future um, the uh, if you look at the the number of cases um, and compare it with the tests that are being done as well. Uh, you know, not just you know aggregate tests, but break it by the antigen tests and the RT-PCR tests. The RT-PCR tests, actually, epidemiologists say, is far more you know reliable than the antigen test. So, if you plot that you know across over the last you know uh, um, six months, uh, India seems to have crossed the peak in the month of September because. If you see the number of tests, they are al they are almost the same level, you know, since September. Um, you know, both antigen tests and RT PCR tests, and yet the number of cases has has secularly come down since the month of of September. So India has crossed the peak, uh, but I would still be cautiously optimistic, especially because we are amidst winter, uh, and you know, I will wait to. To sort of be, uh, you know, really optimistic on this. Till uh, once we have crossed the month of January, I think in the next two months, uh, when you know peak winter will be there, in, you know, especially in you know in our parts of the country, in the northern parts of the country, uh, I think uh, by the end of January, if we continue to actually have you know the same number of or lower number of cases, I think the, it would be safe to then say that you know we would have the. The, the, we would have passed the the, the, the peak, or you know, in, in September. Um, so now, what if, let me let me share with you the outlook for the economy. <clears throat> what is the you know the important difference between the COVID-induced uh, economic crisis and uh, other crises? Uh, if you looked at looked at previous crises, um, and you know that there, there have been a few, you know, in the last uh, you know twenty odd years. Um, if you take, for instance, the Asian financial crisis, um, as a result of which India, you know, for three years, that is twelve quarters, had growth of about three percent. And you know, I'll give you the precise numbers. Um, this was the time when I was actually had, I was going for my PhD, so I. Uh, you know, remember these numbers really well. In 2000, India grew at 3.8%. In 2001, India grew at 4.8%. And 2002, India grew at 3.8%. Okay. So, in other words, for 12 quarters, which is you know, which is much greater than the you know than uh, what we had before this before you know the the, the the eight quarter slowdown that we had before the pandemic. Uh, for 12 quarters, the Indian economy had grown at about 3%, something around 3%. And yet, you know, the reforms that were in, launched at that time, the infrastructure investments that was done had indeed brought growth back to 8% plus from 2003 onwards till the global financial crisis struck. So this is something that is important to keep in mind. Um, 
If you look at previous crises, uh, for instance, the global financial crisis or the 1991 crisis or the 2013 crisis that India India faced, those were typically about you know what is what we economists call overheating of the economy, which is you know a demand really increasing much you know, at a much faster pace than domestic supply. Um, but what the COVID crisis, you know, uh, 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 you know, has has uh, has the uh, has the potential to 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 impact is is growth um, because you know it's it's reverse in some some sense underheating of the economy because it's a big demand side shock uh, and the reason it's a demand side shock is you know is twofold. Um, firstly, because of the need for social distancing. Uh, sectors like travel, tourism, you know, hotels, etc., um, have been significantly impacted. Um, you know, I'm sure all of you yourselves would have would have seen. Of course, during the unlock phase, now many of us have started going to restaurants. Uh, of course, you know, with with masks, etc. But still, you know, the the demand is not or at the same levels as the pre-COVID. So there is a, you know, a, a negative shock to demand for sectors that are particularly affected by social distancing, uh, some of the service sectors. Second, and this is the other, other key aspect, which is when faced with a crisis, you know, all of us as individuals become far more risk averse. And we typically do not spend as much, you know, um, because we may think that, oh, you know, we may need the money uh, if somebody if somebody in our family becomes sick. So, you know, if some of us were, let's say, planning to, you know, to, to, to buy a house or things like that, you know, before the unlock phase, you know, now, of course, I think during the unlock phase, you know, real estate is picking up, even consumer durables has picked up. But before that, what people would do is to say, okay, let me keep this money with me, not spend it um, because, you know, I, I, we may need it. Um, and what that does is when every person basically cut back, cuts back on his or her spending on some of these non-essential items, that then affect, affects, you know, buying across the economy. And that is what we, we economists basically say that the demand for non-essential items, you know, has basically gone down. And that is the second part of the of the crisis. You know, the, the, so your, your service sectors, especially travel, tourism, you know, uh, uh, restaurants, uh, hotels, etc., you know, suffering a demand, sh demand side shock. And at the same time, also some sectors that are not necessarily as you know uh, uh, essential items also getting impacted you know and this was this happened during the lockdown phase unlock phase the second part has really come back very well but still that was something that you know impacted the 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 demand in the economy so so that is the basic uh, you know um, uh, aspect of the covid crisis and therefore, you know, what we did, uh, you know, and here's using this framework, you can now understand why the Indian economy, you know, in Indian government has basically come up with, with such a slew of reforms. Because, you know, what we wanted to do is we recognize that it's possible that the, you know, the, the, the COVID crisis might have an impact on potential growth, you know, in the medium to long term going forward. And we wanted to ensure that that does not happen. And that is why a slew of reforms, the labor law reforms, the agriculture reforms, the, the you know, export uh, 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 production link incentive scheme, the change in the MSME definitions to, you know, make MSMEs grow, grow much bigger and thereby make them more productive. The, uh, you know, emphasis on more more private sector. Um, you know, the private sector policy. Uh, all these, you know, uh, when you when you put together, uh, they are all intended to actually enhance productivity in the economy and thereby ensure that there is no, you know, uh, long term damage to the productive capacity and the productivity in the economy. Thereby, there is no impact to long term growth. Um, and that is why reforms have really been, you know, implemented. Uh, and that is uh, essentially to try and, uh, you know, convert the crisis into an opportunity. Um, I, I think that is indeed uh, happening. Uh, there are two aspects of these reforms that I want to actually particularly touch upon um, and, uh, you know, and tell you how that will impact the economy going forward. Uh, 
firstly if you look at the uh, you know the uh, the two sectors which are really uh, being focused on through these reforms it is what we economists call the primary sector and the secondary sector primary sector is you know essentially your agriculture um, and and raw material inputs um, and secondary sector is manufacturing now these two sectors are very important because you know they create a large number of jobs in the economy and you know if you look at the structure of the indian economy after liberalization we've grown very well in the service sector which do create jobs for people like you you all you know you 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 know very very well paying jobs for very well qualified people uh, people like you uh, but there are i mean for a population that of of 137 crores obviously you know people like you are really the elite um, you know in the in 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 the economy but there are a lot of people who actually are not as well qualified you know as as you have not gotten the kind of opportunities that you have gotten uh, to basically be educated at at such stellar institutions but even they need need jobs and those jobs you know are no, will not be available to them as much in the service sector you know but they will be far more you know in the in the in the primary sector agriculture and manufacturing and so uh, you know enabling growth in those two sectors is incredibly important to create jobs um, and thereby put put money in the hands of people uh, you know and because nothing better than a job in really increasing you know the the well being of a family uh, and thereby of the economy as well because people once they have formal sector jobs they they do spend more they'll think about buying a house they'll think about buying maybe a two wheeler and then graduate to a three wheel you know three maybe four wheeler um, and then they may go on vacations more so you know uh, people who are in the organized sector are likely to spend you know in such activities thereby increasing the demand in the economy and creating sustained growth um, you know for the economy therefore the emphasis on sectors that you know uh, create the maximum number of jobs was very important and that is where these reforms you know the labor reforms uh, you know the agriculture reforms the uh msme definitional changes all these the other ones that i've talked about all of them are very important in you know in, in creating jobs and and thereby also creating you know uh, sustained demand in the, in the economy the second key aspect of reforms that i want to touch upon is the formalization of the economy um now this is important uh, you know one of course to drive sustained demand but the second thing is also to build up build more resilience into the economy why because if you look at firms that are in the formal sector versus firms that are in the, in the informal sector or even jobs that are in the formal sector versus those that are in the informal sector firms and employees in the fo formal sector are far more resilient than those in the informal sector and therefore when we formalize the economy the economy also becomes more resilient to be able to take the kind of shocks you know which are inevitable uh, in a globalized economy if you see just over the last 10 years the global financial crisis and then again the covid crisis so there are shocks that hit the economy which you know which which, which uh, you know domestic policy makers have no control over and so it is important therefore to build resilience in the in the economy and formalization does that Uh, and i think the if you look at the emphasis on digitization the emphasis on technology the jam trinity for instance uh, you know all these are efforts to try and increase formalization in the economy for instance you know something that often times does not get mentioned as much um, but we covered this in the economic survey this year uh, is the extent of formalization that has happened in the you know in the, the workforce in the indian economy if you you know compare 2011 12 data to 2017 18 data this is you know legitimate data put out by the statistics and policy implementation you know they they do what is called a periodic labor force survey uh, earlier this used the survey was called the employment unemployment survey um, and you know when you compare that the percentage of casual labor decreased by about 5 by 5% and there was a concomitant increase in the proportion of salaried 
employees by exactly 5%. So a decrease of 5% in casual labor and increase of 5% in salaried workers, which is what I was talking about. You know, that salary, uh, salaried workers, obviously their wages are much higher than that in the, you know, the, in the, in the, uh, you know, uh, casual labor. So, um, and overall, if you look at the magnitude of, of such, you know, change from casual workers to um, salary, it's about, you know, in excess of two crores, um, uh, you know, so, so, so this is something which is a very important aspect. Similarly, if you look at, you know, uh, female versus, you know, uh, from versus male, uh, the change from casual to salaried workers has been greater among female workers. Um, and these are all good uh, aspects of the formalization of the economy that has happened. Um, so, you know, which will actually make India uh, more resilient. Uh, final bit which I want to touch upon is the emphasis on the Atmanirbha Bharat. Um, you know, and, and there are sometimes, you know, uh, apprehensions about what does this really mean. Therefore, I want to clarify, as you all would, you know, uh, would, would understand, Atmanirbhar in Hindi means self-reliance. Um, you know, Atmanirbhar does, does not mean self-sufficiency. Uh, there is a big difference between self-reliance and self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency is, you know, it, it's like um, the, uh, a classic textbook example of someone like called Robinson Crusoe, you know, caught in an island, uh, catching fish and, and using that fish to trade for coconuts. Basically, someone else, you know, picks coconuts and it's basically a self-sufficient economy which does not need anyone from the outside, from outside that island for any interactions with the you know, world outside that island. That is what a self-sufficient economy is. A self-reliant economy, on the other hand, is, you know, is one which actually does interact very closely with the rest of the world. But importantly, you know, is self-reliant, which means, you know, self-reliance cannot be built without capabilities. You know, uh, if you look at an individual level, if you look at a company level or at a country level, uh, no such entity can be self-reliant without having capabilities. And capabilities, as you know, I think, uh, no better than kids uh, from such stellar colleges like Peck, uh, you know, who can appreciate that self-reliance and thereby capabilities are only built through tough competition. Um, you know, kids like you actually have come into a standard institution like Peck by competing, you know, among a, such a large pool and thereby have, you know, now a part of the best. And that has happened through competition. So, you know, you, you are all capable because you actually have braved that competition to be to, to come here. You know, it's not without competition that you become capable. Uh, and so I think the same thing applies equally well for, for you know, for the economy as well, that competent firms too, that self-reliance and therefore capabilities can only be built in an atmosphere of competition. But one nuance I must point out, you know, if for instance, we ask a five-year-old to, to basically go and write the, you know, the, the, the JE mains examination together with an 18 year old, you know, I think that is unfair um, because the five year old obviously does not have the capability to go and compete with an 18 year old. Uh, same thing applies for companies as well, that a five year old company, which, has, which is still in its infancy, cannot be you know, expected to go and compete with a 20 year old company. And that is the part that, you know, that is, uh, so some amount of, you know, of, of nurturing of the, of the five-year-old, you know, for a finite period of time, you know, the five-year-old cannot pretend to be a five-year-old, you know, even after another 13 years when it actually has become an 18-year-old. 18, 18 year I think that is absolutely, uh, you know, has to be made clear. Uh, but the five-year-old has to be nurtured so that it can become an 18-year-old and thereby compete with our other 18-year-olds. That is what fair competition is, and therefore that is what is the, the, the mechanism for building the capability that is required for self-reliance. So that is indeed what, you know, Atmanirbha, uh, uh, you know, the idea of Atmanirbha is about, uh, with one important um, aspect, which is really enabling and, and benefiting from the competitive advantage that India has, which is the large population and therefore a large consumer base. Uh, if you look at the companies that, you know, um, 
that have uh, produced goods and services in india many of you will go and work with such companies and therefore you know i want you to keep this you know thought that i'm i'm going to talk about when you go and work with these companies uh, if you look at the nature of products and services that have been uh, you know have been uh, implemented by by these companies they've been primarily focused on the on on the relatively rich sections of the population so if you were to actually draw a consumer pyramid you know uh, based on the income of people so the richest at let's say at the top and then people at the bottom of the pyramid you know being 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 uh, lower down uh, you, you know you would you would um, appreciate that most of the products and services have been built for the top 25 30% you know i, I think even 25 30% is a stretch maybe mostly 15 20% of the income pyramid and yet there is a large section of the population which wants to avail the same products and services i think the best example of that is a kind of sham, you know shampoo sachets um, you know if you if you are somebody who uses dove shampoo for instance you can certainly buy it in a bottle uh, you know in the city but you can also buy a small sachet in any nook and corner in the country um, and the poor you know do buy it actually um, so so that is indicative of the poor also wanting the same kind of product and service that you know that people like us would like to use uh, which which companies must think about creating except for fmcg and microfinance these are two sectors where products have been created for the bottom of the pyramid rest of these sectors have not put their creative hats on you know enough to really cater to the you know to the large population uh, you know that is below the top 15 20% and that is a nudge that the atmanirbhar bharat initiative is intending to do so that you know there is basically products and services that are created for the entire population which then creates also employment puts money in the hands of people and thereby also creates demand in the economy for sustained uh, you know economic growth so um, let me let me you know let me uh, bring my my uh, thoughts to a close by uh, by emphasizing that i am very very optimistic about the india story um, you know uh, yes this is a period of uncertainty but it's a period of uncertainty for everybody but you know if anything you know covid will actually strengthen the india story why because you know for the following reason developed economies you know whether it's europe or the united states or japan can cannot be growing at anything more than 2 and 1/2 3% you know in the next next decade or so next decade two decades um you know, among the large economies india is the only one that can grow at 6% plus on a consistent basis china has its own set of problems if you you know uh, a recent survey that was done across the world you know it is uh, uh, you know people across the world uh, have have a lot of misgivings about about china uh, and you know so there is a that there are issues there which leaves among the large economies india as the bright spot that can grow at 6% plus over a consistent period of time uh, and therefore the india story if anything you know gets strengthened and i hope uh, that uh, based on the you know on the careful data and based on the arguments that i've laid out uh, you know to you you would be convinced as much about the india story as i am indeed uh, you know Uh, so let me uh, thank you very much for your patient listening and i would be very happy to to take questions thank you uh and i must say that uh, you know we can certainly keep listening to you for another hour based on the content and the knowledge you have and indeed uh, you know whatever you have been sharing with us it's it's surely a motivation factor for a lot of people like us especially you know so indeed for for myself who studied and worked in new york came back we've just done the whole cycle of having that india story and trying to put the best foot forward so i i must compliment and as a matter of fact trust me everybody is of the same mindset that surely india has a lot more a uh, story to share probably in few years or decades that what we are going through right now 
and i must tell you that i have a list of questions and there are so many people who are looking forward to speak to you so i think uh, dheeraj you would like yeah. to add and then i can right i I'll, i'll just say one thing you know, today is the first day for our 2020 batch and it is so great that on the very first day of their life in pack i'm seeing several hundred of them have joined us on on on, on uh, our uh, channel and lots of questions from first year students and remember this is the first day in college uh, i know we you know you are very very busy but if you can give us uh, an extra few minutes so that some of these kids their, their questions can be answered that would be great sure absolutely thank you dheeraj ji so again i'll try to make the questions crisp justice to time and then wherever you feel you would like to just make it short or detailed you know purely your call uh surely you know i i i somehow had a very strong thought that you feel that the data has a most important role to play when you're talking about either the developed or developing economy so where do you really see in terms of the data which is coming for india i know you referred about the data which was a uh, you know turning point for the industry or you know we were trying to create more and more history but do you really feel that the current state of affairs is reflecting the true data in terms of the economy or uh, you know how how it is purely more refined in in us or global countries vis-a-vis -vis india so what's your take on the data which is actually on the floor these days or predominantly before and in the current covid situation so um firstly i think so there are two aspects to your question um first i think compared to the to the um you know the the, the kind of data uh, especially on the labor market um that is you know that is tracked by the advanced economies uh, we can actually you know we, we can we can learn from them and 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 build and thereby you know have far more data on that for instance um you know in the united states every month the number of people you know employment is tracked um, not just in the united states but in european economies in japan and you know but in contrast in india you know we uh, uh, and and this has happened recently in fact you know um, that the periodic labor force survey um, that that happens once in a quarter but at this point in time it is actually post the quarterly data is only for the urban economy um, and that to you know it comes with some lag so um, you know I, it, that is something that we can really invest in uh, because uh, if there are there is you know if, if, if a policy priority that india must be seized upon it is job creation if you were to wake me up in the night you know just and shake me up and say hey ceo tell me the three things that you, you know that that worries you at night i would say job creation job creation job creation so uh, you know and therefore uh, tracking data for that i think is is extremely important um, and that's that's an area that i think where we can now we are the fifth largest economy i think we should stop basically thinking of ourselves as uh, you know and that mindset of oh we are a developing economy no as the fifth largest economy we should be looking at the largest economies and trying to to be you know build in all the good things that they have um, that's at least the mindset that that i like bringing uh, you know in, in, into this um, now second aspect of your question you know like maybe uh, there's something i'm reading into your question um, maybe you didn't made it make it explicit is if if, if at all is there are any concerns about the quality of data you know in the indian setting etc um, i would you know, like i would be emphatic and say that the quality of data is absolutely good um so you know uh, don't get don't get basically you know uh, drawn by uh, by by some of the you know uh, um, less rigorous narratives that 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 come on this i would urge those of you who are interested to go and read the chapter 10 of this year's economic survey volume 1 chapter 10 um, which is basically there was some commentary you know uh, uh, about a year back a little more than a year back saying oh you know our uh, is, is our gdp growth overstated um, you know we did a very very careful analysis of that 
um i you know when some some commentators for instance have have, have mentioned by far the most technical chapter ever written in the economic survey uh, and and showed very very clearly that there is absolutely no overestimation of the gdp growth um, and that you know any insinuation that uh, that our our numbers are basically you know are are biased um, is incorrect um, you know and the reason i actually you know i felt the need to write this is that you know um, करीब 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 यू नो पांच पांच से छह दशक कितने लोगों ने अपनी जवानी खपाई है ये ये सिस्टम को स्टेटिस्टिकल सिस्टम को बनाने के लिए और अच्छी चीज बनाने में बहुत बहुत मेहनत लगता है एंड जस्ट वन मोटिवेटेड यू नो सेट ऑफ नरेटिव कैन रियली अन डू अ लॉर्ड ऑफ द गुड वर्क and you know as as someone who actually you know uh, uh, empathizes with the amount of good work that has been done by people you know over the last 5 to 6 decades i think it is extremely critical to actually put back the credibility which is indeed what we've done you know through that chapter making it very very clear you know um, that there is absolutely no problem with the you know no bias um, so if you think about it in terms of a continuum right there is there is error or inaccurate there is inaccuracy uh there can there is bias and then there is you know what you know, some some people will allude fudging you know now um there, there there can be inaccuracy only because when the economy is really evolving very fast you know the 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 data may not be capturing some of that it's like you know if you try to basically measure temperature now you know with a digital thermometer in you know instead of a digital thermometer you let's say use a very old you know or, or you know I, i'm not saying that you know our methodology is very old but let's say if you were to use something which is a few years you know uh, not not current then there may be some some error that will come in but that is not saying that oh you know like like let's say i might have done when i was when i was a kid if i didn't want to go to school you know temperature thermometer ko doodh mein dal diya aur mere ko bukhar hai so that is basically something that is bias there's a difference between the two um, and I, i think that's not what is happening so i wanted to make that make that very very clear sure sure absolutely uh, so before i really take it forward i want to make sure how much more time we can steal from you so that uh, you know we can just draft the questions accordingly let, 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 let's 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 keep going actually when you know i think surely I, i'll let you know for sort the of last last couple of questions or so when 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 i think uh, at the right time thank you very much uh, sir to some of the questions are obviously relating to the economy where we are right now and what so one, one 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 suggestion you know if questions are repeating what i have already said please skip over them and you know let's take questions that are actually you know we will that will provide me the opportunity to provide newer perspectives and not just repeat what i've already said surely surely and i'll keep that in mind so what i was quickly going to kick start is uh, you know the whole turn around happened when the demonetization was bring into picture and then subsequently there has been a so called cash economy which predominantly just went away and then gradually what happened we have seen is that the bigger organizations the big guys of the industry were able to handle things in a more systematic way or they had more resources in place vis-a-vis the msmes which predominantly are the major driving force of you know a country like india obviously had some short term and a long term challenges put in place so what what we were trying to understand is that two fold question first is do you really see that there has been a major shift in this whole ecosystem how do you see the msme especially in the covid situation and predominantly when we are talking about recession right now when we are talking about the numbers which have affected globally our foreign relationships everything put together how that predominantly will affect the msmes though i'm sure the ground reality is you know is aware but what typically needs to be an, an opportunity for the msmes in this particular situation and the and the second element to it is that do you really see that the privatization you know which predominantly has been happening in the psu bank side in the railways we've been talking about 
air india we've been talking about do you really see that the privatization will also help make that change in the indian economy in the future so you embedded three or four questions in this question yeah uh, i was just <laughs> um firstly uh, quick response on privatization um there's this chapter that we wrote in the uh, last in the, in the january this the economic survey this year that was titled privatization and wealth creation um so if you google privatization and wealth creation you know that chapter will come up um so uh, i think those who are interested in digging deeper into that actually you know can can go and you know look at that chapter um i think privatization is something that is um, the, as as the title of the chapter itself so yes is you know it's it's good because it actually brings in nft brings in efficiencies um and um, you know i think the private sector policy that has been announced now uh, where except for a couple of strategic sectors the the uh, government will get out of you know of 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 uh, of businesses in all the non strategic sector is you know one of the key reforms uh, i think that's a step in the right direction um now you know your the first part of your question relating to msmes um and and demonetization so you know i, I did touch upon this earlier by saying that formalization of the economy is something that is important um you know and and because formalization brings in resilience um you know and one of the things that in in economics that um we all have to understand is that there is always a trade off there is a cost and a benefit so if some benefits have to be have to come you know some costs have to be taken and typically you know and this is the way i think about about you know choices uh, faced with trade offs that if there is a policy that creates some little bit of short term pain but creates long term gain you know that's one one kind of policy a second kind of policy is one which creates short term gain but creates a lot of long term pain uh, i think you know uh, it, this is something that if you have to make a choice between these two one has to actually choose that which creates some short term pain but a lot of long term gain and not one which creates some short term gain and a lot of long term pain uh, and i think uh you know formalization is is one which can which create some short term pain but creates a lot of long term gain why because you know if you take an msme which let's say if it has a formal if it's formalized it has let's say its tax return or you know a, a, a other a G, maybe gst return it can go and access credit it can access credit from the you know from from banks if it is just driving if it is doing purely cash business then you know it doesn't have the formal records to go and take credit and most msmes typically face cash constraints or financing constraints and so becoming formalized is something that enables them so uh, therefore i do really think that you know formalization which started with the demonetization and you know then was accelerated through gst and a lot of the reforms that are being done is indeed in the long term interest of msmes themselves because finally you know if you think about it and you are a, you 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 are you're a businessman you would understand this very well that you know if you are if you have a company with a turnover of 100 crores vis-a-vis a company of you know 1000 crores it's possible that if you have a company with a turnover less than 100 crores you may get some benefit from the government um uh, now if you choose to remain at at less than 1000 crores because you want to get that government benefit and then when you reach let's say 98 crores you go and create a company in your wife's name and then a company in your brother in law's name and then another company in your driver's name etc each bringing it up to 98 crores you do not avail economies of scale and thereby the profit profits that come to you, you are the, the biggest loser of that by being so myopic in contrast if you actually build a com- one company with basically which has 400 crore turnover 500 crore turnover then you you know generate economies of scale you know where you might have been making let's say 10% profit on a 100 crore company you will make 15% profit on a 500 crore company and that's the that is what you know when you look across the world across history 
those who actually you know grow big are those that have long run vision dur ki soch yeah. you know that is what is dur ki soch is what makes distinguishes somebody who remains small versus somebody who becomes big and so it is in the interest of msmes themselves to actually get formalized by having that dur ki soch and you know government policy is basically just enabling that dur ki soch i i completely agree with you and i think that is where i would the next point is when you're talking about recession it naturally will affect the budget which is going to be in few months right now so obviously you being part of the whole think tank where do you potentially see the upcoming budget i mean obviously it it needs to look at from the holistic perspective of the indian economy in terms of the growth and obviously our internal challenges in terms of our own revenues as a government but certainly i'm sure it is going to be affecting a lot towards the industry keeping in mind the pain as you rightly referred to and dur ki soch which is the vision of the government and obviously for the lot of industries as well so keeping in mind that you know officially or unofficially we have kind of agreed that the recession is right there globally and partly india as well how the recession can be handled right now and what potentially can we expect in terms of the budget as as from the government which will be beneficial for the industry the budget will be focused on growth that was quick <laughs> surely um so in in that particular case you know let's just change the little topic to you know to to a different uh, segment uh banks and knowingly that you know your core has been in the banking sector and corporate affairs what's your take of the recent guidelines from RBI saying that the corporates needs to be getting into a banking sector i'm sure you would have got this question long back and you might have answered this question so many times but i think at this stage uh let's keep it from a student's perspective because you know they they need to relate it that how things will be affected if a corporate is taking over as a bank so keep it from a student's perspective and not you know on on the larger holistic way of explaining it that'll be really helpful and i'm so happy that our first year students have asked this question you know the, the guys who just joined college today they can think so much to ask such a question i'm so happy yeah maybe maybe you can mention the name of the student that has asked that question uh yeah i just i'll i'll just add up in in uh, you know it was just my bad i just uh, if somebody else has a name i guess yeah maybe maybe you know that person's name can be emailed to me actually you know i would uh, i i okay so firstly this is a proposal that has been brought up by an internal working group of the central bank that's the first thing to remember um and um it's a proposal and that to an you know internal proposal so uh, you know we will 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 wait and watch whether this is something that um you know uh, uh, sees the light of the day um but from a conceptual perspective you know the the uh, main thing that i would like to mention is uh, this is something that we had covered in detail in the economic survey you know chapter a chapter that was titled the golden jubilee of bank nationalization um and where we showed that uh, a lot of the willful defaulters you know these are companies basically that have been uh, euphemistically called the dirty dozen um you know the willful defaulters uh, that recognized by the reserve bank of india um uh, where firms that um you know um, whose financial statement qualities quality was very poor um and not 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 just at the time when they were declared in full defaulters but around 2014 15 about 3 4 years before you know they were labeled in full defaulters the quality of their financial statement was um, was was really bad uh, and i can see twinkle gurg asked the question so congratulations twinkle um, um, i i i think you know the the 
Twinkle's question had a twinkle in it, um, and uh, it, you know it was it's wonderful. Um, so uh, the if you look at the the, the re research that um, you know we, we've shown in the economic survey, uh, these firms typically the quality of their financial statements were very poor. Um, they were they were doing a lot of related party transactions. In other words. You know, doing transactions with related entities, um, the quality of disclosure of these related party transactions was very poor, um, and the promoters, you know, pledging their shares um, was was much higher in these companies. You know, when you put all this together, each one of that is actually relating to corporate governance, and I think you know the main concern you know in this is relating to corporate governance. So I'll leave it at that. Surely. Um, Last yes. couple of questions. Sorry. Last couple of questions. Okay. Then I have, um, you know, quick seven eight questions where we would just want your yes no maybe kind of opinions, which will be more of a quick sheet. But before that, let me just you know share some of the uh, you know another questions with you, and I think that what relates to uh, one of the query which is also raised by Sono. Uh, and I think I've just read about the recent uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, you know, report as well, which predominantly talks about how stock market is not proportionately, you know, behaving how the economy is right now. And we have seen it in the global markets as well. So India is no exception per se. I mean, we can talk about, you know, the transition from Trump to Joe Biden or the vaccine coming in. There could be so many reasons which, you know, can relate to it. But we all understand and to an extent believe back in our mind that the stock market is not being able to effectively portray how the economy is behaving right now. On that, we would like to take your thoughts that is it true, how far it is, and do you really see, I mean, I'm not saying you need to say there is going to be a correction in the market, but do you really see that the PE ratio or whatever numbers we relate to from stock markets to economy how is that behaving these days? Firstly, a caveat, you know, uh, don't go and buy or sell stocks based on what I actually am saying here. Um, uh, don't blame me if you actually, you know, um, lose money. Uh, you can give me some credit if you make money though. But So, on the stock market, I think the first thing to recognize is see, the difference between, you know, what you see in economic numbers like GDP growth, etc., versus the stock market is that the stock market actually, fact, you know, the current level of the stock market is actually, you know, because of future expectation. You know, I think that's one key difference between, uh, you know, between macroeconomic numbers and the stock market. Um, for instance, you know, if, if, if Q1 growth or Q2 growth does not factor in as, you know, what is going to happen in Q3, Q4, and subsequent, you know, in a subsequent year? But the stock market level of that actually does factor in, you know, future growth. That's that's one fundamental distinction that has to be kept in mind. Um, you know, we finance professors basically say that the, um, you know, uh, uh, stock market value is basically the discounted value of future cash flows. Um, and that's why, you know, discounts in the, you know, factors in the future. So uh, the reason I bring that conceptual difference up is that, um, it, especially with India, as I said, you know, being one among one, one of the, the, the you know, uh, uh, singular bright spots for, you know, once, you know, we get out of COVID, the 6% plus growth, you know, in a large economy, that does build in a lot of growth potential with which other countries may not have, especially after the COVID crisis, number one. Number two, you know, the reforms that have been done, which do, you know, impact the productive capacity and productivity in the economy going forward. And so that is also about the future. Some of the, the market may be factoring that in. So uh, th there is certainly some, uh, you know, some part of the stock market's value you know, is reflecting fundamentals. Um, that said, there is also, you know, uh, the, the, the part that there's a lot of global liquidity now because of the, you know, easy monetary policies that are being followed by advanced economies. And so money that is looking for return, uh, high return, 
and India is basically providing that. And if you look at the FBI flows and the FDI that has come in, you know, record numbers. So that's reflecting. So part of it is also actually because of the liquidity uh, you know, globally that is looking for, for good returns. I agree with you. And I think one of the another uh, point which just came with it is that financial literacy has predominantly not been taught in the early stage of our schools and colleges. We've always seen you know, parents and somebody of the elder generation has been guiding us. And I think that's where one of the suggestions came that potentially we should add more financial literacy related uh, subjects at an early stage so that people understand how to manage their resources and finances and everything, which predominantly has not been actively in Indian market. I mean, I'm, I know it's there in the global world, but India has somehow been working on that. So if you would like to add a point on that, I mean- That's a good suggestion. It's a good suggestion. Just, Correct. Uh, that being said, um, whenever you say, I'll just move on to the rest. We, we can move on to the yes/no questions now. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm. I think just pen down a few questions, and maybe you can just help us in building a vision. Because as uh, Dheeraji rightly said, you know the current uh, viewership audience is a lot towards the first year students, which potentially has a future vision and, you know, getting into PEC college. Uh, when do you see India being a developed country? Which year? <laughs> um, you know, the, the, I, I would have answered this question much better if I were an astrologer. <laughs> um, well, okay, let, let me, now, that, that was of course a little, you know, sort of just uh, uh, in, in, in a lighter way. Um, so I, I think there's a good likelihood that India, um, you know, could be a $10 trillion economy in the 2030s. So in, in another decade from, you know, the, thereabouts, um, so, sometime in the 2030s, it's possible that India can be a $10 trillion economy. Um, and, you know, at $10 trillion, um, then, you know, our per capita GDP, therefore, can be about you know, three and a half times what it is today, um, which will then actually, you know, uh, uh, would keep us, you know, would, for, a, for such a large economy, um, you know, I think per capita GDP would then be about, uh, in, I'm just sort of roughly calculating between $6,000 to $7,000, you know, uh, approximately. Um, I think uh, my, my, my numbers could be wrong here, but I'm just sort of, I'm based on memory. I'm just calculating this, uh, you know, using the per capita GDP as I remember. Uh, so I think in which case actually it should be, uh, I think that would be a good, uh, you know, uh, a per capita GDP to have. Uh, so, so I would say therefore, you know, the 2030s. Surely, great. Uh, interest rate. Do you personally think that we should have higher or lower interest rates, short term and long term? I don't comment on monetary policy. Yes. Okay, fair enough. Uh, do you think that India really should have one, three, or five slabs of G uh, GST, or it should just, you know, three? three. Fair enough. Um, do you think India should have more taxes to save or spend? Should Indian government have more, you know, puts more taxes to save or spend? Not during the current times. So in the current times, they should spend or save. Who uh, you know? People, yeah. Current 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 times actually, if you know, uh, economic crisis are times when government should be spending. Fiscal spending is extremely important now. Great. Um, so you've been a professor and you've been on the other side of a bureaucrat. Which one are you liking and why? <laughs> I a professor both. or a bureaucrat? I I honestly enjoy both. Um, you know, uh, I, and. I, I'm, I'm not being, you know, I'm, I'm not just being diplomatic. I actually honestly enjoy both. Um, see, there's a certain pleasure in being a professor. Um, you know, uh, in, in fact, if I have to live my life again, I would again choose to be an academic um, because, um, you know, nothing, nothing gives me more pleasure than, um, you know, two things. One, being in a classroom among young people. Um, you know, and that's one of the things that I, I, I used to observe, um, you know, we are the professors age every year, but the incoming class remains the same age. Yeah. 
and so um, you know you get to you get to sort of uh, see you know youngsters and one of the best things of you know interacting with youngsters is you know there's so much passion in them so much you know kuch kar guzarne ki jo wo wo jo you know wo junoon hoti hai na that is something which um, you know i really love among youngsters and um, and i think i also think that that aspect of of being of of you know of a youngster is something that all of us should keep alive you know irrespective of irrespective of you know whatever age we are in kuch you know kar guzarne ki wo junoon actually wo honi chahiye hame uh, you know and and that is something which actually i draw upon a lot you know from youngsters secondly also you know so as a professor you teach and you do research and research is something that i just love um thinking deeply about issues um you know and um it it that's something that i that that i thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed so i i you know really um you know have enjoyed the being a being a professor but at the same time you know if there is one role you know in the government which is best suited for a professor it is the it is that of the chief economic advisor because here again you actually you know you think deeply about issues um the economic survey is um one where you know i get to do a lot of research um think deeply about a lot of issues um and you know um and and think about issues that are very wide ranging you know so wide ranging that i would not have definitely you know uh, thought about these kind of issues if i were just a professor you know uh, when you are thinking about actually the indian economy uh, you know Uh, my microeconomic to macroeconomic financial sector to to healthcare to education you know to to the digital economy all these you actually get to and you know i must say my learning curve on this job has been so phenomenal i mean i've learned so much uh, in this that you know and and learning is something that really gladdens me and so you know i have thoroughly enjoyed this job as well um and i uh, you know and, and that's an honest answer sure and we can surely see that passion in the way you have really explained it uh the last two ones which book are you reading these days which book am i reading i'm actually reading a lot of research papers now um i'm i'm not you know uh, reading a book currently uh, because you know which, uh, book, which book would you suggest for our students to surely read Okay uh I, th- that that's that's a question that I can certainly answer um there is one book that I that that you know really influenced me a lot um so okay I I'll give you I'll say two books you know um one is uh, this book called talent is overrated um it's a it's it, the 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 essential message is in the title itself um you know I, and I'll and I'll say this. I, I don't know how you know uh, students today think about, it, but you know back back when I used to be in IIT, um, somehow you know people used to basically there was this in IIT Kanpur in particular there was this word called bucket, you know who basically was um, th- that that word was used for someone who says who you know with with the least amount of effort basically goes. and cracks examinations um and as a result you know you would find a lot of people you know hiding in corners of the library studying you know to basically actually working hard but but not uh, you know wanting to be seen to be working hard so um you know so, so, so the reason i bring that up is having you know been at a place like the university of chicago which has uh, produced more nobel laureates than then you know uh, all other countries put together you know leave the united states but all other countries put together has not produced as many nobel laureates as just the university of chicago and having seen so many of these nobel laureates you know at close quarters and having been taught by them uh, what i have actually discovered um, and and not just nobel laureates but you know a lot of top policy makers whom i have had the privilege of of interacting with and some of the people who you know uh, you know history will look back um, for instance the the current you know prime minister um, 
you know, Honorable Prime Minister. Uh, having seen all of them, you know, what, one thing, one learning that I've gathered is the importance of hard work. Um, and, you know, just saying that talent is, uh, talent is something that is, you know, gets you for some, helps you in your, in your you know, maybe in your um, younger years, but you have to work hard. And so this book basically makes that message to a lot of good research saying that talent is overrated. And that's therefore something that I would leave as, you know, um, as an important message. The other book, which I have actually been influenced a lot by um, is, a, is a less common book, but I would still urge uh, those who are interested me. This book, you know, I think, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure less number of people will go and buy it and read it. I'm, I'm, I'm damn sure about that. Um, but for those who are inclined, I think I would still recommend, it's called the Vashishta Yoga, uh, uh, sorry, Yoga Vashishta. The title is Yoga Vashishta. Um, it is actually, a, it's, it's uh, written by uh, Swami Venkatesananda. Um, it's a conversation between, um, between uh, you know, Vashishta Muni, who was, uh, you know, Rama's teacher. Um, it's a conversation between Vashishta Muni and, and Rama. Um, and, you know, very, very deep. Um, and, you know, if you, if, if, if one wants to actually uh, get answers to the ultimate questions in life, um, I think, you know, there can't be a better book um, that, I, that I would recommend, Yoga Vashishta. Surely, and uh, I have a last question, but before that, I, I really uh, admire, you know, um, uh, when you connect uh, the life where, you know, two of the major crystal balls, what you have referred in the past is health and uh, family, you know, where, uh, you know, you just can't come back. So I think it just relates to how important life is. And I'm sure, you know, your learning from the book has made you connect to how the two crystal balls are the most relevant ones. So again, uh, the last one, which is from my side, uh, please share. And again, this is because the entire India globally, everybody admires one and the only person whom you have got the opportunity to be mentored, uh, Mr. Raghurajan. Uh, tell us one point where you both agreed and something which you don't agree on. <laughs> I think that's, that's something I'm that I'm just saving the good one for the last. I, I I think you know, given that this is something that will be is being publicly uh, released, I think that would be best set for a for a private drink. But maybe you can tell us one learning you have learned from him, or something which you have you know as a vision for India. Some see, you know, first of all, I, I he he's been you know a very very. Uh, supportive mentor uh, of mine and have enormous respect for him, you know, both as a scholar and as an individual, you know, uh, and, and um, I, I've learned a lot by observing him, you know, uh, in, in especially for instance, you know, the um, someone for someone who's had so much success, you know, professionally, um, the way he remains grounded is something that you know I have um, really you know admired, and I have tried my my you know my my very best to try and emulate. Um, you know because I think eventually one of the things that and I by by looking at people like him and in him in particular, what I you know learn is eventually it is the what is most important is to be a good human being. Um, and I think that's something which I have, um, you know, I have, I have, um, uh, uh, you know, drawn inspiration from uh, by, by, by looking at him. Uh, not just me, there, you know, there are so many people who will, you know, uh, my former colleagues at ISB and others who will mention that, you know, if, if he sees, he sees you at a, at a, at a conference or a seminar, he'll, you know, he'll, he'll uh, inquire and, you know, just, a, just, a, just a good human being, I think. You know, and that's something which I actually, uh, honestly, when when I look at people, I I really admire that far more than you know than professional achievements or you know or or you know uh, economic prosperity or you know I I get far more in, influenced by the quality of a human being than than any any uh, you know material uh, uh, um, you know aspects. 
and in that sense uh, you know somebody whom i actually have admired and i've been inspired by absolutely and uh, i think everybody on on right now would just second you for you know who he is and the way you have explained or you know shared your experience with him so i think uh, you know time just keeps flying and we never realize that you know we can be with you for i think as much opportunity we have but uh, we really appreciate you know you you sparing all the time with us uh, so before we really you know try to wind it up i would just like to take last thoughts from you in terms of especially the students you know as as they are getting into that whole professional world next four years after that jobs you know the whole world is going to change because you know you and i possibly can relate to once you get into engineering college you are happy once you get into a job you are happy so that cycle has just started for them they have got into a professional college engineering college like back what next last words from you uh okay i think two two aspects one i would say um be lifelong learners i think that's the most important um you know if you learn then um then i think you know everything else um which is money power privilege all that will will come um don't put the cart before the horse actually i think keep learning and keep growing as an individual i think you know all the other aspects will come the second uh, you know uh, a piece of advice that i would like like to leave is with with students you know from as stellar institutions as the as as punjab engineering college is to recognize how all of us are so privileged um, you know in a population of 137 crore people to be studying at institutions like this you know uh, we are indeed very very privileged and with privilege comes responsibility i think you know that's that's something which i would um, you know really mention and there can't be a better way to 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 capture this than uh, you know a shloka from the bhagavad gita um, this comes in chapter 3 shloka 21 which goes as yat yat acharis acharati shreshtatah tat tat evetaro janah sayat pramanam kurute lokas tad anuvartate what it means is yat yat acharati shreshtatah acharan is behavior yat yat how you know yat yat acharati shreshtatah shresht as you you know would understand in hindi is somebody who's privileged somebody who's looked up to and people like us you know um, are given the privilege that we are bestowed will be looked up to by by common common people you know people who are less privileged than us um, so yad yad acharati shreshtatah tat tat evetaro janah janah is basically the other common people follow us actually and so it therefore there is enormous responsibility sayat pramanam kurute praman you know hindi praman means proof not just talking about it but actually the way we behave that proof of behavior you know and that is what eventually people look at sayat pramanam kurute lokas tad anuvartate so this is basically the responsibility that comes from being privileged and i think you know uh, we have to recognize the responsibility that is bestowed when we are given privilege as well and i hope that all the youngsters here would treat their privilege with enormous responsibility thank you sure uh, deeply appreciate and the only thing which we can't show and uh, share right now is the applause which you potentially are getting from everyone it's definitely a standing applause from my side you know speaking and having an opportunity to spend time with you and you know i think uh, the most important element uh, for someone like us on the other side is that we feel happy and contented when we see that the people who have responsibilities as what you are referring to are also visionaries because unless you have a vision in place unless you know what is potentially right now and obviously you know in the time it becomes difficult not only just to implement things but obviously to push it internally and even for a country like india which has a you know major demographics everything just going in our favor needs to have a channel and a vision in place and i think it's really nice when people like you 
are at the right spot and at least making a noise and letting everybody, the academians, all the stakeholders, including government, that, hey, this is what needs to happen. It could potentially obviously come from the global experiences you have or what you have in terms of academia trying to put in place in the practical knowledge. But altogether, I think that's, that's the vision, that's the motivation for people like Indians like us are glad and have it here. So with that, I think, uh, uh, Dheeraji, would you like to share something or I can just close up on, on the words? I just want to thank uh, you, uh, you know, for a wonderful talk and taking up so many questions. I'm really sorry we took so much of extra time from you. Uh, and I really, really enjoyed uh, listening to you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah. Pleasure mine. So with that, once again, um, you know, I would like to um, give over sincere gratitude um, to Dr. Q, um, KBS. And I'll take a privilege to call you Subhu because I think that's where one of the discussion initially started with. Uh, and needless to say, you know, the entire Punjab Engineering College uh, faculty who has really thought and drafted this whole Centurion series where we have, as a matter of fact, everybody in India globally who has been on live right now have the opportunity to take thoughts and uh, most importantly, Dira Sangiji, who has really conceptualized this and, you know, really given a vision to a college like Peck as well. So, you know, sincere gratitude to them. And uh, uh, Ms. Sundara Singh Ji, who initially started this discussion, the entire team, and I think I would like to add, especially here, because we have always realized that the seminar is happening, but then there are people behind us who really put the entire effort and thought behind this. So really thanks to the entire team and the entire audience, students, friends, industries, Everyone who has been here today, uh, spending time listening to him, sharing their thoughts, their questions. I think the all I can say is that both sides, the questions and the answers were really nice. We all thoroughly enjoyed it. And we surely look forward to have a similar interaction with you. Personally, whenever you know this whole thing settled down, we would look forward to invite you again to Punjab Engineering College, it's a great auditorium. We have absolutely, you know, marvelous students who look forward to meet you in personally. With all that, I would like to once again give my personal sincere gratitude from the behalf of PEC to uh, Dr. Subramaniam for sparing your time, for enlightening us, for giving the wisdom and the thoughts and to everybody else who has spared your time. Thank you very much. We thoroughly enjoyed it. And we look forward for the sessions more and more to come. Thank you.